Welcome to the Five Eight. We take each of the week's five most effed up topics and spend eight minutes discussing each one. Five topics, eight minutes, two hosts, a guest. Which we're very excited about tonight. A little singing, a lot of swearing, and as many cocktails as we deem necessary. LB, how are you? I'm well. How you doing? Uh, I'm I'm pretty good. You know, you I'm are? pretty good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, how was your week? Give me a quick recap. Um, did you hear that the Knicks won? The Knicks won. They closed okay. out the Cavs. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. And, um, okay. you know, I don't know if you heard the big news, but uh, I- I'm surprised it's not the rest. I think Sam-, Sam Alito knows who the leaker is. Did you hear this? Oh, oh. He's not saying. He's not saying. Might have been the umbrella man. Might have been somebody behind the grassy mm-hmm. doll. Definitely not a conservative, though, he says. Definitely not somebody whose name rhymes with Winnie Mamas at all. Couldn't be he that. is the Angela Lansbury of SCOTUSes. We he are is. so lucky to have him and his detective skills. He is. He is. Yeah. It's uh I'm I'm happy to have him. I think I think I speak for everyone here. We're so yeah. so so fortunate. Um the other thing that happened is I don't know if you know, I, I've been um involved in the art scene. Yeah, oh. yeah, because there's a new artist where you put your name, you send out an email, and the artist will come and make art for you specifically. You have to be invited to join this art show. It's called Blueski. I don't know. It's very oh. cool. Yeah. I haven't gotten invited yet, but um, okay. yeah. I think it's yeah. like a Banksy rival, I think. I think they're using that model. I'm not really sure. Oh. All yeah. right. That's really interesting. Yeah. What are you drinking? Are you drinking your Manhattan? I am drinking a Manhattan. I am. This is like the consistency is fantastic. I am mixing it up and I'm actually having a cocktail. I know I normally have water or whatever for you with Uh-oh. you guys. Um, but tonight it has been a hell of a week. I it can't has. even describe this week, especially today. Just a little bulletin up front. Um, I think this this writer's strike is absolutely happening. It would take a, a complete miracle in the 11th hour. And we knew it was. But it just sort of hits you. I went through that last strike and, oh, boy, I feel like I had a little PTSD today. And I was just, everything is a crash running. Agents, lawyers, make sure if you've got the thing and the thing and sign the thing now. Because on Monday, we're on strike. We're on strike. I can't touch anything. Um, it's crazy. People are making signs. I don't know. I don't know. This is going to really affect everybody. I, 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 is this going to be bad? I think it's going to be bad. The only thing I know about the last strike is that they did the second season of Heroes with like writers <laughs> who were not participating in the strike. And in a related story, that show fell off a cliff in like eight minutes. Into well, the that's why. Season. Yeah. 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 You know, you're not. No, there are no scabs in this house. No scabs. It's like a slang, but. With the, no, 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 you you can't. No, it's very, oh, no, no, no. This is a really serious union. Like you, you, they don't go on strike often. Um, and when we strike, we strike. So it's a big, big deal. And it's a necessary strike. Um, it's just crazy. There's no, all this profits and there's, none of it's going to writers, you guys. None of it's coming to us. So, uh, you know, I don't know. So, I'm having a cocktail. I'm having a Moscow mule. I because like this, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Well five eight. Here here's to uh here's to the strike being successful and Thank short. Thank you. Yeah, mm-hmm. to all the writers out there. Yep. Got my sympathies, Lord knows. Yeah. Okay, let's get to the topics because yes. we have a great guest and yeah. it, this is gonna be really good. And uh we want to get there. We want to get there. Okay. I didn't even look at the banner before we went because I was busy doing you know what? For everybody, <laughs> have a nice. I finally. Day. It took me like a full year to figure out to wait to put the banner up until after the opening credits. Okay, yeah. Because you can't good. see Ron DeSantis's shoes when the I know, banner's yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you got to take it down with brother yeah. things. Okay, I know. I'm a quick. All learner. right. So Trump cards. Okay. Hang on. Ah! Okay, set the timer. The timer going. Here we go. All right, go. Okay, Trump cards. Um, uh, Trump. It seems like he's in trouble, and I know. There's been a lot of, oh, this is the end of Trump stuff for seven years now. We've been hearing this, but this was a really awful week for him. I mean, yeah. the, I, I can't even imagine, like, 
you know, first of all, shout out to, to E. Jean Carroll for the, you know, the courage and, and, and doing yes. what he's doing. Um, I think now we just sort of, you know, read about it and wait, but to, but to actually go into a courtroom and do what she's doing requires an awful lot of courage. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think that everybody is, is, uh, admires her, her, uh, courageousness and, 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 you know, willingness to take this on, um, that lawyer is an asshole, I think. Joey Tacos. Yeah, uh, he's not good, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, whatever. He played the old. It's It felt like, you know, 1972. It's like, are you really doing this, Joey Tacos? But he is. I don't think it's going to win the win the jury at all. Um, no, not when Trump is on the, on the campaign trail miming raping someone. I mean, what was that? Was I don't that, know. Was he really actually just making a, a poopy in his diaper? What was he not doing? Not sure, but it I looked swear pretty to awful. You, it looked awful, but I think he was having a bowel movement. I mean, maybe. I do. I, I really thought, is this a deep fake? Like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, I, I can't. Don't know. I don't know. It was very, very strange. Um, so, you know, that happened, and again. Whatever happens, the headlines are now Trump has been accused of rape. I mean, then that's he's been accused of rape lots of times, but now in a court of law. So, you know, it should hopefully stick this time. And, uh, yeah. you know, let's let's hit this criminal um, at all angles from all of the crimes that he's committed. You know, um, Mike Pence testified for a full day, to you know, with Jack Smith, um, which Probably I'm going to just go out on a limb here is not good news for Trump. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that you can plead the fifth for se what was it? Five hours, seven hours. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I don't, of course you could, he could, I, I'm not sure that would be the best uh, legal strategy for him personally. So I think Pence always takes care of himself. Um, if he's smart. I, I, I don't know that he was, I, I don't know that he would like to take the fifth. Don't you have to be involved with the crime? Like, I don't know. I don't know necessarily how much, how involved he was. I think maybe they were just sort of took for granted that he would do what he was told. Cause he always does. Well, we don't know what the, this is a grand jury. We don't even know what the charges would be. If it's, yeah. you know, if you're involved in the planning, um, if you're conspiratorial and you're involved in the planning and there's anything about that, but then you pull up, you know, you decide you don't want to, Okay, I drove to the bank robbery, but I'm going to go ahead and drive away because I don't want them to get in the car with me because I don't want anything to do with this. I think you're still committed a crime. So I we really don't know. We, yeah. We just don't know. And we have to wait. Yeah. So, now, I'll say this about Pence. I mean, obviously, he he's not a very, you know, brave sort of guy. He, he's just as milk toast as they come. But uh, when Tom LoBianco was on the show, and I think you weren't here when he was on here. He said uh, he told the story about when Pence accepted the VP nod from Trump in the basement of the or in the, you know, the little lounge area of the house in Indianapolis there where, where, when he was governor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Trump tried to strong arm him and be like, well, you know, what are you going to do for me? And Pence flipped it on him, was like, no, what are you going to do for me? Like he kind of like gave it to him a little bit. And it, OK, so Tom demonstrated okay. some spine and political acumen. And I think. The people advising him are definitely savvier politically than the ones, you know. Oh, he, he's a long time Trump. politician. Yeah, he yeah. knows what he's doing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Somebody says here, he says, brave as mother lets him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently <Yeah>. so. <laughs> and Weissman says it's time to charge him and he might know, yeah. you know, he, he what he thinks is better than what I think. So I. I will believe that he's going to get charged when they actually do it. And until that time, I'm just going to, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, as they say. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I want to go back to the E. Jean Carroll thing for a second. Please do. In that uh, other witnesses are coming forward to share their stories. There's something that's being allowed in this case. And the judge appears to be very fair and on it. So which you don't really know because we had a Trump era of judge of justices that are just like, ah. Yeah. Um, but this judge appears to be, you know, following this sort of regular course of <laughs> courtroom uh, uh, proceedings. And so there's going to be some 
other accusers that come forward to show a pattern because this crime did happen so long ago, although it I don't know that the statute's out on that. And again, he's not he's not in there for rape. He's in there for defamation. And um, so what she has to prove is that he's lying when he says that this didn't happen. Um, and so those other witnesses are coming in uh, on behalf of uh, Eugene Carroll's side of the case, and they're going to be telling their stories of what he did to them on the witness stand. They'll be on the witness stand when they tell that story. So I think, you know, I keep coming back to with this and with everything else. Um, it should be enough. This is yeah. the this is the disqualifying thing is that he's an assaulter and a rapist, and that that's not enough. That there's a whole section of our there's an entire political party in terms of the 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 business side of the machines of the GOP, not just the voters, and a huge swath of that party's voters that are like, yeah, so what. That is what gets me. It just gets to me, guys. It just is, of all of the things, the treason horrible, classified documents, nuclear secrets, if that's what was in those classified documents, oh, the worst, espionage, terrible. But honest to God, that that wasn't the line back in 2016, 2015, 2016 to say, there's no way we can let this guy on the top of the ticket. He, he's a rapist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it was, it's hard to even get people to report about it. I remember doing a, a Twitter thread about it and it's like, there's a lot of examples. There's a lot of accusations at the time of the thread. There were two dozen or something. Now I think there's four dozen. I mean, the guy has a, a demonstrated pattern of doing these things. Yeah. And the people accusing him are not like crack. They're like, Hey, I'm a journalist from people magazine. You know, yeah. they're, they're, people with credentials who are risking their careers and yes. reputations to do so. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and yeah. then, you know, cut to the, the, the video of him dancing with Epstein, you know, I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. Like I don't, it's not nothing about the guy screams innocence, not Ivanka on his lap, not the Epstein stuff, not you know, the way that he used to walk through the dressing room at Miss Not Teen that his USA. voice on a recording says, I can grab him, they'll let me do it. That too, yeah. His own and yeah, and just this week, him simulating it. And if you, I mean, you know, yeah. he's not a good actor, but that was a pretty good simulation. I'm just going to say that. Oh, you God, know, no. It, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to be sick. Look. Sorry. Let's Time move on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. They say by the but best. you're right. You're. I mean, you're right about the the women thing. You know, it's about and, and it go, moves into the larger patterns here about not, you know, taking women's issues seriously enough. And I think that's a problem. And it's always been a problem, and we really need to address it. I mean, this is happening with with this, and it's happening with all the anti-abortion yes, legislation and, everywhere. And where all of that is going, and the, to connect the dots here. Because it's even if you're raped, you have to carry your rapist baby. Even if yes. you're a child who was raped, you have to carry your your pedophilic rapist baby. Yeah. Um, that that where that is all going, you know, if I'm gonna look at it and go, okay, where's this heading? This is heading into and and the Texas Governor Abbott is saying we're gonna do away with rape. Well, what that means is we're just gonna we're gonna end rape as if that <laughs> yeah, it's insane. But where that's going in their thought, their think tanking, if you keep going forward with that, it's what you're going to do is you're going to decriminalize rape. Right. Because you're going to make it about the male experience. And if the man doesn't believe that he raped, if he thought he had a right to the body or, hey, you know, I'm famous, so she lets me grab her, that we're back into that uh, lane of there isn't rape as long as the man doesn't perceive it to be rape, or he's not a man that we're going to identify as a rapist because of his wealth or because of his status or because of his color of his skin or where he came, you know, where his, where he was born. Um, that it's then we're, we're getting into that territory. We're just, this is where this Republican party is pushing us. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know. We got to move on. I can spend Let's move on. on this. Let's move on. We don't need to spend as much time too on this. Dark. Too dark. Okay. 
Oh, this next thing isn't dark. Okay, Tucker. Bye-bye. Yeah. 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 Were you surprised? Yeah. Yeah. I was. I thought Lachlan would hold on to him to the bitter end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because he's he's so connected into Orban and 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 so heralded uh, by um, Russian state media. Yeah. And yeah. I, I those bringing in those actors, those foreign actors, seems to be um, as sort of thought leaders. And this is like this is what we want. We're going to do away with democracy because democracy doesn't work. It just seems like this guy was the guy that was all the way at the forefront of all of that. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be where the Murdochs want to push America is towards Hungary mm -hmm. and Russia. So, yeah, yeah, I was I was shocked. I really was. And I was like, OK, this isn't about dominion. It's not about money. No, and Tucker's a loss leader he, and he's. He's the thought leader and a loss leader because advertisers right. do not want to attach themselves to him, but they don't really need that. The way that the gates work when you're when you're a network and you you're up on the MSOs, which are all the cable networks and affiliates, and then you're up on the satellites, um, you you're making money off of the subscription services if you've got a piece of that, and apparently Rupert does. So it's not that ab advertising is a big piece of the pie, but it's not his only piece of the pie. What he needs is a solid, immovable audience. And that's how he makes his money, even with his with the providers. So which are the satellite and the MSOs cables. So um, Tucker, I think, was really important for that. And obviously a very close friend of Lachlan's and very close with all the bad actors. Um, yep. So it has to be something is coming out. I do think that we're going to learn some really horrible stuff. And I can't stop thinking about, remember when he was, when Matt Gates was on his program, mm -hmm. right? I do. He's, I recall he, this. We'll get rid of the stuff for the sex stuff. That's really dark and awful. That's how they got rid of O'Reilly. It's not a me too thing. They just, they don't want the lawsuits from that. It costs them even more. And it's bad because you're hearing tapes of the voice of their talent that runs contrary to what they're putting up on the screen. Mm -hmm. So the thing with Gates, uh, audience, help us remember this. It was, wasn't Matt Gates saying, you know, you had that dinner with the girl. And, yeah. Yeah. And it Tucker was, exactly was like, that. what? No. And then yeah. he got rid of Gates, right? Yes. Yep. What yeah. was that? It seemed like, well, I don't know. It seemed like a warning at the time. I remember thinking, that Gates was issuing a little warning on air to Tucker, but I don't know. And a little you know, threat, a little blackmail. Look, to your point, they have him by the short hairs because they have him contractually. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to pay him money. If he continues to like do stuff, like whatever thing he said on yeah. Twitter, I guess that's going to stop now. He's not allowed to go around trashing them. There's lots of things that he cannot do. And I know people are like, he's going to run for president and he may, he if might. this, well, he may if he's made to do it. But I, my position on that is there's so much fucking weird dirt on this guy. And I remember Kat Abu Ghazale was on my show and I asked yeah, her, does he, ever, does he ever talk about himself? And she said, no, he never talks about himself. Oh. He never makes it personal. It's never about him, his family, his kids, none of it, right? He's his private life is really fucking private. And look, this is a guy who is really good friends with Steve Hoff, a pimp, an actual pimp who owned a brothel. And Tucker used to hang out with him all the time. Like, yeah. what did they do? Did there's they just did they go to church together? Like, I don't know. But it's there's weird shit. There's shit with his dad. There's shit with his son who works for Jim Banks. There's shit I don't know about. There's shit with Matt Gates. There's all. And these are just things that we've been privy to to some degree. Or that, you know, there's a little bit of smoke around a fire that we can only imagine. Fox apparently has this file on him, I read in Rolling Stone. I saw that too. They've this got, Oppo research file. They've got like, their own little blackmail file going. I don't think that Tucker Carlson wants the media all up in his shit, is my guess. I think he enjoys his private Look, life. But let me tell you something. Yes, <laughs> I agree with that. He was gone quick. He was like, I'll see you Monday. And then it was like, he's out. 
he didn't even get to come back and have a week where he did his last week of shows. They didn't, they didn't, uh, Lou Dobbs him. They didn't like, they didn't give him any, any, it was like, you're out. So there was that also that reporting that he was talking about himself as the resurrection to like Rupert's Looney Tune uh, girlfriend, a fiance that he dumped. So maybe something happened between Tucker and the. I, oh God, I hope so. Oh, that would be the greatest thing ever. That would be, be so, like that. That would be so good. Yeah. Or just uh, a conversation. That we have to write it now, LB, before the writers go on strike. It's, it's going to be too late on Monday. <laughs> Something's up. Uh, that's, Something that's a funny thing to talk about. That's know. a funny thing. Yeah. That's a funny thing. Do I think uh, there are people out there speculating that the Department of Justice is rounding up all of the media for media that's really foreign media and disguise like don't count on that everybody you know like i don't believe that when i see it but um yeah, this is something something personal happened yeah period full stop for rupert to do it the way he did it to his son's best buddy something mm. happened something came yep. out something came to light something some line was crossed yeah yeah so, I'm glad he's gone. I'll say that. Tuck off, I say. <laughs> Tuck off. Um, okay. That's enough about that. That's, That's enough, enough about that. All right, we're a minute 29, but let's go ahead and get to our guest. We have to go ahead because you know what? What? This, this is exciting. Oh, you know how something come together before the writer's strike for me? Well, you? you know that Leonard Leo yes. uh, wants to start this company, right? That yeah. invests it, that tries to do to entertainment. Yeah, he's what he did to, coming into world. our space, yeah. Yeah. So here at the 5-8, we have long tentacles in the industry. Oh. We were able to to capture a sneak, a trailer that they made for one of their first uh, motion pictures. Oh, well, let's see it. Yeah, we're going to have to take a look. Here it Little is. Screening. Oh, wait, I have to turn off the, I have to turn off the thing. Turn off turn. the thing. Turn I have off to hide the thing. thing. Okay. Anyway, here it is. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for my wife. Coming soon from Opus Dei Entertainment. From writer-director Harlan Cameron Crow. It's where it has to happen. This is where it has to happen. But tonight, our little project, our company, had a very big night. A very, very big night. But it wasn't complete. Isn't nearly close to being in the same vicinity as complete. We live in a cynical world. A cynical world. And we work in a business of tough competitors. I love you. You? Complete me. And I'm just... Shut up. Just shut up. You had me at insurrection. Judy McGuire, coming soon to a Republican controlled state house near you. <laughs> oh my God, Chunk. Give it up for Chunk. Uh, Give it up for Chunk. Yeah, you know, we come up with these ideas. We're like, hey, Chunk, can you do this? And then he, he just. Does it, does it somehow? Yeah, we did a little voice work on there though. A little we bit did. Of voice good work. job, good job yeah. by you. Um, remember last week on the show, we were talking about like Pleta and Ginny and what movie and that was are they Thelma and Louise? No, they're Jerry Maguire, that's what they are. They complete each other, they complete Thank each other. You. It's so Thank sweet. Oh, I have to put the thing back up. All right, wait, where did it go? Oh Sorry. no, there we go. Got the banner. Okay, it's time for by the way. There's going to be an after hours tonight, folks. Yes. True Player will release the URL. I will promise not to screw it up this time uh, later in the show, but stick around for that. We'll be back for that uh, after. Okay. Our guest tonight was the former chief counsel to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. He worked on judicial ethics, oversight, dark money issues, and advised on the nominations of Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Covid Barrett. Alex Aronson, welcome to the show. 
Alex Edson. Hey guys, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's so good to see you. I remember being in that being in that in that hearing room with a you know a mask and a face shield on. So that's apt. Oh, good. Well, let's let's also clarify for everybody that you, you were advising, but you were advising Sheldon. Yes. Right. Yeah. You weren't advising anyone to. You weren't advising the everyone to bring these people in. It's once they were in, you're like, oh no, okay, this is who we're dealing with here. Now that we're poised to confirm somebody eight days before the election, yeah, yeah. let's let's give some advice. Yeah. yeah. Were you there for all three? You were there for all three, right? No, I wasn't there for Gorsuch. I showed up right after uh, right after Gorsuch was confirmed. I was in the okay. Justice Department. I was a civil rights lawyer, and I and I decided I needed to leave when um, Donald Trump's uh, assistant attorney general for the Civil Rights Division sat us down and told us we would be executing campaign promises through the Civil Rights Division, which is not what I had really signed up for as a line lawyer there. Oh, God. Oh, wow. <laughs> That feels like a new story. Did that never hit the? You know, it's it's an interesting kind of. It's a, there's an it, there's some interesting wrinkles to it, right? I think on some level, administrations get to set the policy priorities for their administrations, and there's right. some some okayness to that. But it just you know it wasn't for me. And I think you know certainly they crossed the line in in many ways in terms of bringing politics into law enforcement decisions at the Justice Department. What were some, can I ask? Okay, this is we didn't expect to talk about this, but let me just ask you. <laughs> what were some of the um, campaign promises that all of a sudden had to become part of the law enforcement. They, they did not specify, but it was the it was the agenda you saw unleashed through the Civil Rights Division. I mean, the Civil Rights Division, um, particularly the voting section, was you know um, really instrumental in the you know pretextual effort to get that um, citizenship question added to the census. That was one oh, of that's them. right. A okay. lot came out about this lawyer, John Gore, who's a Jones Day guy with buddy of Don McGahn, who was you know, really instrumental mm. in pushing that. He got caught lying to a federal court about, um, you know, other, other kind of efforts of the voting, voting section and civil rights division there. It was, it was pretty ugly. So I saw, I saw the writing on the wall and I decided I wanted to have no part of it and would, would rather be in the Senate to have like an oversight, oversight capacity. Um, to really push back and try to, to check some of those abuses of the rule of law. So there, okay. there's been a lot of um, news stories lately in the last month or so about these Supreme Court justices. This week it was, I mean, I, I almost had to stop and write the, down all of them at the same yeah. time because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got the, all, all the Clarence Thomas stuff, which is just, I mean, ridiculous. It's I mean. insane. The, the amount of graft going on there is just, yeah. it boggles uh -huh. the mind. Uh, th this week we had the, the the news about Gorsuch, who apparently sold some shitty piece of property that he owns for many times more what the, what it was worth. Uh, right after getting confirmed, funny that. Um, I mean, I'm going to go in. I want to go into real estate, so I think I'll just become a Supreme Court justice, <laughs> and then it'll all be free. I'll get the best deals ever. Good yeah. way to get rid of your distressed assets. Who knew? There's Amy Co oh. Amy Barrett uh, got her fucking book deal which i'm gonna i'm gonna go out and learn. i don't think it won the advance back i think that probably it's gonna be many many it, it, it'll be you know the world will be over the, the cockroaches and rats will be buying books before yeah. we ever see that see that money it's back. it's one of those deals where they've got you know like boxes and boxes of copies at fox news or something like that yeah, yeah, no, yeah. they're in harlan crow's you know yeah. Basement, remaindered twice jenny thomas's basement okay it's called by the way just just for people in that uh, you get to talk about film stuff. I'm going to talk about a book thing. Okay. When you have, when you create copies of a book that don't sell, yeah. they wind up getting pulped or sold very cheaply. And they're, it, the word is remaindered, which is such a wonderfully yeah. poetical word. They're okay. remaindered. It's remaindered. like sad copies of a book that, oh. you know, any author knows, you know, any non best selling author knows, knows this, and feels it with heavy heart, but, uh, Push yeah. tab on the fold-up tables in front of the bookstore. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the thing. So, yeah. um, and then and then Kavanaugh. We in Kavanaugh. The, this new story came out about Kavanaugh. D is this just? Do they all do this? Is this just a Republican thing, or is this? Does everybody do it? That's the first question. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the kind of like you know taking sweet trips on other people's dime, I think they kind of all do that. I mean, we know that Justice Ginsburg took a lot of trips, including with. But, you know, so you know paid for by people with, with interest before the court. So I don't think it's totally unique. But, you know, I think all of your your guys amazing work kind of really exposing Leonard Leo's influence operation. I think it's a, it's a different beast on the right. I think they've got 
um, you know, a, a very, you know, you know, figured out kind of plan here. We saw it with Scalia taking hundreds of hunting trips. We were able to document like 85 hunting trips that he took without disclosing them, you know, often with people that had interest before the court um, or were known kind of partisan actors or donors, big Republican donors, not disclosing them. He had a little trick that he, he pulled that was, it was actually the loophole that the courts just closed because they got asked for comment, presumably about, you know, Justice Thomas. Um, but the but the loophole, you know, basically what they would do is they would have he would get he would organize an invitation to go speak at a law school, and then he would have a, a billionaire or a, a rich partisan donor, you know, host him and fly him down sometimes, um, you know, on a private jet to um, you know to uh, you know a private hunting lodge, and then disclose it as a trip to a law school. That's, mm. that's that was the move. So it looks like an innocent trip to a law school to give a lecture. In fact, I feel like they work out their travel plans and what they want to do and then approach the law school and say, hey. Absolutely. That's yeah. exactly right. I think That's it's and actually, there's, there's, some, there's some evidence of that. There's some evidence. Yeah, I think I think the yeah. law school is the last little piece. They just, you know, where where yeah. can we, how can we justify this plan that we've already made rather than, yeah. oh, hey, I got asked to go speak. Let me see if I can wrangle up some some yeah it, yeah i mean i think i think it was oh, the wow. kansas I, I might be have the state wrong but the, i think the dean of the kansas law school was trying for years to get scalia to come speak and he wouldn't and scalia basically was like get he literally solicited it he said get me a hunting trip and i'll come and then he did that's what happened and he, he took the hunting trip he went on this hunting trip um and it was hosted by i'm going to get some details wrong but it was hosted by the dean and the and um and the, oh yeah the, the, there was one Hello. of the hosts was arguing courts cases before the court on behalf of the state, That's which was right. flying him around on a state-owned jet. No, none of it was disclosed. Wow. So, so yeah, these guys are all. Been, this has been going on for a long time. But he's <laughs> it, was he like the Scalia I'm talking about? Was he like the template for this for these guys? Because I feel yeah. like they all looked up to him. Certainly Thomas did in every way. Absolutely, I think that's right. <laughs> you know, Scalia, you know, helped found the Federalist Society. He was there. Yeah. At the Federalist Society's first convening at Yale Law School, I think he was he was very much the sort of the icon and the leader for them. And I think he's almost certainly the person that that Clarence Thomas was referring to when he said that he yeah. consulted his colleagues and was told basically this is okay. We can That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, walk yeah. through this huge loophole and it's fine. Yeah. So Scalia is the original schemer, and Thomas is Cato Caitlin. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's what we're getting to, right? He just, I call them the luxury couch surfers. It's just like, you know, whatever, right. whatever. He might, he might have beat them though. I mean, some of these trips that we've read about are pretty, pretty. Oh, they're yeah. extravagant now. Yeah. Well, the bill, there's billionaires now, you know, yeah, we're right. in the era of billionaires. And so, and private this and private that. Um, there's no oil painting of Scalia on a hunting trip. <laughs> no. Although he did die on a hunting trip. He died on a hunting. Yeah. My favorite is that they've got this guy Mark Paoletta going out defending Clarence Thomas. He's like their go-to Clarence Thomas defender. And he's in the painting. Like, what are you doing? Like, he's not just in the painting. He's sitting in front of them with his legs open. Like, yeah. oh, look at me, yeah. me man. It's too good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like really funny and it's great to laugh at. But oh my god, it's so but devastating. It's so corrupt. It's, it's just it's so unreal. Corrupt. Yeah. Okay. You guys so have just like completely imperial power now. That we have yeah. no ability to check really all right so let's connect some of this a little bit so mm -hmm. for scalia in the past and i was just reading and this is an old thread of yours um where and i didn't realize this but it was those hunting trips and it was the the, the person that was funding him to do that was someone that was putting the amicus up in front of the court because heller was coming right yeah, sort of, sort of. Um, yeah, that's basically right. I mean, it was actually, a, this wasn't a hunting trip. It was a gun conference in Nuremberg, Germany. Oh, yeah, it was like, not, not much. International better. trip. Yeah, they gave him a, they gave him a, a silver pistol at that event. Okay. And yeah, he was hobnobbing with a bunch of gun rights activists. And, and it was really interesting, actually, after he died at that hunting lodge, a lot of his, these stories started coming out of the woodwork in local, um, local papers, on, on local airwaves. People were proud of their trips, having hunted with this great man, you know, so they came out and talked about it. And these these two lawyers in D.C. did this enterprising investigation, gathered all this evidence. They compiled all these trips. It was amazing. And they had this one. And yeah, so the uh, the you know gun rights activist, Alan Gura, who had, you know, active you know litigation, filing amicus briefs, 
um, you know, he, he's talking to Scalia as the, the district, the, the circuit court in Heller um, issued its decision. And so they're sitting there talking about what's going to happen with the Second Amendment. And Scalia basically gives away the game. He tells them, you know, well, if we don't have if we don't have four votes to take a case, um, then we won't take it. We, we need four votes to take a case, but we won't take a case unless we have the five votes to win it. And so, you know, and if, and if we take it, I think we'll, we know we'll win it. Basically, he tells them that. I mean, so it shows you like he's thinking about this like as part of a team very clearly. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. I think it really completely un undercuts any idea that these are impartial jurists looking at legal questions like from a blank slate. And then he's doing, you know, he's being like com these, these, these nominees when they come to the committee, they'll never tell you what their views are on an issue. But he's comfortable doing that in a private setting with a gun rights activist telling him the outcome of this case. He caucused ahead of time for them, yeah. or or during, yeah. So he's Wait, but I, an activist. That's it. I think though, he's isn't caucused. it true that though, when you when you put the robe on, it's like one of these Harry Potter robes, and you're immediately transformed into an impartial jurist? Is that I read yeah. that somewhere? I'm pretty sure. Uh, Is that well, not true? Know, that's, that's how it's always been treated. I think there's been, you know, that, that, I think that's how our media, how our political yeah. kind of leaders have always treated it. You know, they've, and I think there's a lot of complicated reasons for that, but. One thing that I think is heartening about this moment in our in our time is that um, it seems like that's that worm is starting to turn a little bit. I think the press is starting to look at this court as a more political animal. Um, they see it's subjected to serious um, political money and pressure, and that the court itself is kind of opening the floodgates for all of this corruption. It's not just the trips, right? It's the it's the cases that they're deciding that are yeah. really doing this. And you know, I, I think one thing that's important to to note. Um, I think there's a lot of very understandable frustration out there among people who are seeing this corruption as plain as day. And then and, and they're frustrated that Democratic leaders aren't taking it on more strongly and there's yes. no real mechanisms for accountability. You know, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the accountability itself and the availability of accountability is very much a democracy problem. And, and the maneuvers of this court, particularly over the last 10 or so years, have really eroded democracy in a way that has made it hard for Democrats to have the power, right, in our in our branches, the political, the quote unquote political branches to hold them to account, which isn't to say that they shouldn't be doing more or leaning more aggressively into these fights. But that, I think, explains a lot of like why we don't have the votes to do the things we need to do to correct this very obvious corruption. Right. And I think it's it's Democrats because we're actually in the majority of the, the majority of the people don't they want gun regulation. They don't yeah. want this sort of, uh, you know, any, it's the militia that have the Second Amendment be rethought of and reconstituted. Nobody even realized that was happening to where, Absolutely. you know, a completely uh, unhinged individual can amass an arsenal, right? Um, just as an average citizen without even having background checks. That's where it's all been headed with that decision. And it hasn't, it's just been a full, full steam ahead because yeah. the only guardrails would have to come within the industry itself. And we know the industry wasn't going to put any of those guardrails on it. And I consider the Republican Party part of the gun industry. Yeah, um, They've decided that's their alignment. I don't know that it's about money. I think it's just about power. Um, but there's a process in here uh, that you were just describing in terms of knowing that it's a team. Like, so it's it's always team building and going to the mattresses for someone that you know is going to play on your team the way you need them to play on your team and then they get rewarded once they get there or on the pathway to get there to ensure that they're actually on your team so clearly i'm talking about kavanaugh here because i think that is the <laughs> most extreme example of something that went through the nom uh, of an individual uh going through the nomination process where it was going to be this guy's go. This guy's getting in because we've already worked it out that he's our team player in these ways. Yeah. And uh, at, I was always just so struck during that whole process. And Greg and I were rushing and rushing and trying to get stories out as much as we could to focus not so much on the allegations that came out later with Christine Blasey Ford, but on the lies that he told and the issues that he had and the conflicts that he had uh, that it seemed like the if we get into it, he said, she said, everybody's distracted. They're not paying attention to any of this. And he said, she said, almost always goes for the he. It's just like, if you put that on the table as the gauntlet, it's yeah. going to go for the he. It just yeah. is. Yeah. I don't Especially care. When, how you got the, when you got the FBI and the you know purported Senate investigation completely. In right. Mind. So let's talk about that a little bit. I, I'm just very 
if you don't mind, I want to know sure. what that was like for you on the inside of all of that. I, I can't imagine. Um, it was always, I was always so dumbfounded. It's like, there's a whole list of justices they could put up. Why are they going crazy for this guy who's so clearly compromised in every single way? Yeah. Um, so what was that like for you? And what did you, what do you feel like from the Jeff Flake bullshit to the Chris Ray investigation that went nowhere to like, what part of that stands out to you the most as like something maybe we could fix? <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't happen again? Yeah. Trying to be hopeful here, trying to- yeah, No, that's, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot in there, right? And, and yeah. Um, yeah, it was a ter terrible thing to, to live and work through. It was, um, I didn't have any gray in my beard before that. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I think there was, you know, before the nomination, there was the sort of normal jockeying among, you know, people that wanted the job. I do think, you know, I don't have any evidence for this, but, you know, Kavanaugh was a was a Kennedy clerk. Um, you know, Kennedy's stepping down seemed, you know, pretty deliberate. I would, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Kennedy had made his preferences known. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he made his resignation contingent on some some voice in the in the selection process. I, you know, I don't have again, like I, I don't want to say that that is what happened, but it wouldn't surprise me. I think we are certainly at the point. You know, even Debbie Stabenow in her you know interview with Isaac Chotner this week in the New Yorker talked about how she's approaching you know uh, judges, you know, Democratic appointed judges, and urging them to take senior status because we have an opportunity to replace them. So I think you know there's a lot of kind of um, you know window dressing around the courts as sort of an a political institution from both parties. Um, but I think behind the scenes, this has been happening for a long time. And then, you know, once he was selected for the nomination, I think then they really cl close ranks around him no matter what. Yeah. Then it's just, this is our guy and we got to get him. And I do think that, you know, to your point about him coming, being sort of a dyed in the wool partisan, I think that's what his record very clearly displayed. Yeah. He, you know, he was willing to sort of really stick his neck out and be a fighter in the important fights, right? He was on the Bush Gore team in the litigation, mm -hmm. he was on the Ken Starr team yeah. really as one of the most aggressive and forward leaning people. I think there's pretty it was strong his ideas. idea to push the blowjob stuff. Exactly. Yeah. That was him, yeah. by the way. You know, yeah. we, you know, we've had, you know, we've heard and, 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 I, and there's, you know, this hasn't been reported out and it hasn't been verified, but I think there's reason, reason to, to suspect Kavanaugh as having leaked, you know, grand jury information out of that, out of that investigation to the press. Um, which is a serious criminal violation. Wasn't that Senator, uh, what, the Vermont, the uh, older gentleman Leahy? Vermont? Leahy. Yes, Leahy. Yeah. It's like he's he's been at this so long. Kavanaugh was at all this fuckery for so long that even Leahy was like, I remember when you came into my office and all of a sudden the shit was on the in the public and seemed to be insinuating that, that, that that's really where it was going. And then, boom, Christine Blasey yeah. Ford. And, we yeah. lost that conversation altogether. There was more. I mean, we haven't even completed it all. Like, I mean, you know, they before the before before I think a lot of people forget that before the sexual assault allegations, which were covered up and buried, um, before that there was you know the suppression of hundreds of thousands of pages of records from his time yeah. at the White House when he worked on all this controversial stuff right. and very likely lied about torture it. memos the, the and lied about stuff, the torture memos. Um, yeah, warrantless surveillance, very controversial and extreme judges that he denied. Um, having worked on their nominations, you know, the receipt of stolen uh, nomination strategy memos from the Senate Democrats. He very clearly had those memos and misled the Senate about his possession of them or his knowledge of their, of their, you know, yeah. origin. Like they're democratic strategy memos. Why would the Bush White House have those documents? So, yeah, Cory yeah. Booker was really releasing a lot of that information. And I remember everybody's hair was on fire and they were all, you know, the, in terms of the Republicans, they were losing their mind. And then, um, well, yeah. they made up a bunch of stuff to try to keep all that stuff hidden. Yeah. They literally were just inventing new kind of protections that didn't exist. They called them committee confidential records. That's not a thing. Similarly, <laughs> you know, si similarly, the, the 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 document production team, which was being run by a, a Bush operative, this guy named Bill Burke, you know, they were they were claiming constitutional privilege of all these documents. They were producing documents, which which they which meant they knew they were relevant and responsive to the to the inquiry and the, the nomination that they were supposed to produce them. They couldn't totally withhold them. They they were blank and they were just stamped constitutional privilege. That's not a thing. There's no such thing, right? Yeah, like, if, you want to assert executive, if you want to assert executive privilege, do that. But that's not what they did. 
No, they made it constitutional. They, 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 they could, right? Because they because they had a Republican ally in the in the chairman ch chair's role. So that's how. Yeah, there was also the cry. who would cry? Lindsay would just cry. Uh, it was it was uh, it was Grassley at the time. It was, oh, Grassley, but then which is, really, which is really right. rich because you know Grassley's got this you know long reputation as like Mister Transparency in Government, and to this day we've got you know Senate Democrats working with him on transparency measures like cameras in the courtroom, um, which I find you know a little baffling, but. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he he kept saying this is the most transparent, you know, Supreme Court confirmation in history while he worked to suppress hundreds of thousands of cases. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, can I ask you something? If you don't want to answer this one, we just move right along. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> why the fuck was Mark Judge not hauled in front Ooh, yeah. of the confirmation com it, it, during the Blasey Ford allegations? You have here a third person in the room with the, there were three people in that sexual assault allegation, right? When mm -hmm. they were teens. And one of them was Mark Judge, who was Mr. Catholic, whatever, worked for the, uh, I, was it the Daily Caller? He worked for something like he was a, this guy's a, he was Kavanaugh's friend forever from college, stayed in that, um, you know, far right echo chamber of, of media, had this weird website with all these seemingly underage girls with weird, you know, and music set to it and all this. What the hell? Where, what, why was that guy shoved in some beachfront thing and hidden away by some weird operatives? And everybody just said, okay, well, let's not call this guy. What, what? Oh, oh what? the Democrat, we were, the Democrats were trying to get him to testify. I mean, we were calling for him to be called in, but we didn't have any power to, to do that, right? They were, they were completely in control of the confirmation. I mean, even the, even the hearing itself, having the hearing itself was up for debate. They didn't want to do that. In fact, there's a really fascinating email that's been produced uh, since the confirmation that reflects a conversation between Grassley's top nominations guy, this this guy Mike Davis, who's pure trouble, um, and um, and Len Leonard Leo. And it was Leonard Leo who apparently, according to this email, um, pressed Mike Davis to to have that hearing. They they thought they needed to have that hearing for, for Kavanaugh to be able to rebut these allegations. I, I you know I don't actually I can't speculate as to why. Leo wanted it, but that's my best guess. Because in a he said, she said, he yeah, always I wins. You're right. I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. And everybody's distracted away. It's a calculus. Yeah. It's a calculus, yeah. which is why I think when she testified, it kind of freaked everybody out for a little bit. Even Donald Trump was like, I don't know. Yeah. And then oh, you should have um, seen the senators. You should have seen the Republican senators out there. They were fucking. I wrote, right. I wrote on the Senate trolley with Chuck Grassley, and that guy looked like he'd seen a ghost. Yeah. Well, but then Kavanaugh came in and cried. Yeah. And then Lindsey Graham had a hissy fit, like yeah. li a literal hissy fit, screeching. Clearly coordinated with Kavanaugh, right? Like, they, they were both yeah. talking about a, a, a search and destroy mission. They were using yes, the same terminology. Yeah. yeah. They had their talking books. All right. Well, whatever. We're stuck with this guy. Yeah. Are yeah, we well, stuck you know what them? I think is really important, though? Like, we can't, we're not stuck with them, right? Like, we need okay. to push back. Like, you know, this is like th this court, its power is a magic spell. Right. It, it has power because of its legitimacy and its legitimacy is in serious question. And so people watching this, people that are engaged in politics, you know, t talk to your senators like they need to hear from you. They need to know that there are people behind them that want them to fight on this stuff because there's competing priorities. Right. They're trying to confirm judges. They're trying to pass appropriations and do hard, hard governing stuff. But they need to know that this is a priority. And it is because if we allow this court to continue on its war path, it's all gone. Right. So. This is it. So what can we do? What do we, if we're calling our senators and saying, this is what we want you to do, what are we asking them yeah. to do? Tell us what to tell them. So I think the, the, the most important thing that we can do right now, uh, you know, all of these court reform ideas that are out there are important. I think, um, you know, I think they're, they're good. I think we, we need something like court expansion to take back the power that was stolen Absolutely. You know, through these anti-democratic and norm breaking maneuvers from Mitch McConnell and others. Um, but the th but I th the thing I think we're, we're pretty far from being able to do that, right? They've eroded democracy to the point that we don't have the votes for those things. So what I think we can do is really investigate and lean in and make this a political fight and stop treating this court like it's some apolitical, you know, entity full of you know you know quasi deities in robes that whose whose decisions deserve our our respect. And I think we need to be really really looking at these decisions hard, looking at them for signs of activism, a lack of principle making a strong political case against this court because it is it is showing itself for what it is and you know it, it, it ties back to all of these efforts to really capture the court from industry and ideological interests 
Okay, so so ahead. basically what you're saying is like if if say a Sam Alito um harkens back to some law from Britain in the 19th century about witchcraft to try to we should maybe question that a little yeah. bit. Okay. Yeah, and we are, right? But like I think, you know, there's a big disconnect between like, you know, what the what the commentary are are kind of noting and rightly outraged about and what and the action we're seeing from our from democratic leaders and and so yeah. I think like the only thing that changes that is real popular movement building. I think we have to scream at Chuck Schumer until he comes out from wherever the hell he is. Because uh, where is he? Everyone still talks about Mitch McConnell as if he's a Senate Majority Leader. Who was he meeting with? He was meeting with somebody last week. I can't. I can't remember now. I don't. I think, I think Chuck. I think Chuck gets this. I think there's strategy happening right now. I think there's going to be okay. a plan. All right. I mean, it, it's a big. It's a really big challenge, and I think you know it's. And we, we need really good strategic, creative thinking to think about how we're going to get out of this because we're in a bad place right now in democracy terms. Yeah, okay. I, don't know. We don't. Now, Wait, I, 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 I have one question. I know you're not with White House anymore. Um, you're not in that job anymore, right? Right. Yeah. But where are things with his request of Chris Ray to come in about the FBI Kavanaugh investigation? Because it clearly wasn't an investigation. Yeah. It, that that was like a year ago. He was saying this is the deadline. It's ongoing, so they're they're working on that. They're, and the, the the Guardian story today, which everybody should read if they haven't seen it, it really it really shows you just quite how what a cover up was being perpetrated here. They really buried some really really damaging evidence against the justice. Um, and um, so so they're working on it. They're working on a, a on a report that will come out, and I think will add a lot of clarity to what exactly happened with the FBI investigation meddling by the Trump White House to confine that investigation and to keep yeah. them from talking to people that were trying to reach the FBI with firsthand accounts in some instances of, you know, Kavanaugh engaging in sexual assault um, that would have corroborated these witnesses. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's going to come out and it's going to be a big, I think, challenge for the, for the Democrats in the Senate for how they're going to deal with that. I think they're going to need to confront it. And when the Doug Lyman documentary hits, yeah. right, about this, what piece of that do you want us to pay attention to, grab onto, instead of getting distracted by something else and screaming at people about our senators about the wrong thing? What can we take from that to put up front and shove in the faces of our senators and say, pay attention to this, pay attention to this? Yeah, uh, I, think it's gonna be, I think it's going to be an important film. Okay. Um, and I think that the thing that they have that um, I had never seen before or heard before is a tape of a person who watched Brett Kavanaugh engage in exactly the type of sexual assault that Deborah Ramirez alleged against him. A different woman, um, uh, but the, you know, the, 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 the audio tape is vivid, it's sober, it's firsthand, and it's unimpeachable. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, it, this is a person of, of serious stature. Uh, he's, he has, you know, he tried to bring this information to light during the supplemental investigation. He tried to bring it, he brought it to a, a Democratic senator. That Democratic senator shared it with the with the chairman, Chairman Grassley, he shared it with the FBI, and as far as we can tell, this person was never interviewed, and and his story oh, never came yeah. out. And so, you know, I think it, I think it's frankly incumbent on this individual. His name is is Max Steyer, to to come forward with his his testimony. He he has not wanted to talk to the press about this. I can understand why. I mean, he you know, it's like this is a person he knows. It's a person he socializes with. His wife is a is a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So I can understand his reticence to enter this political fray, but I, I think the public interest demands that we hear from him about what happened in college with Judge Kavanaugh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, wait, wait. Good, good things. This is good. I have a couple more questions before I, we, we, by the way, we've abandoned the timer for your second. Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we don't. Yeah, 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 we never put the timer on about. the guests. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's very interested in this. Okay. I have two more questions I have to ask before we move to the next, to the next segment. First of all, Roberts. Mm. He's the it's chief justice. What does that mean? What, does he have any power at all to do this? Is he just a coward, or is he just one of the one of them and doesn't well, give a fuck? I, you know, I'm pretty cynical about the Supreme Court, but I, I, you know, I think I think Roberts is a, a very strategic, and I don't think he's as extreme as Alito and Thomas, but I think he's very much on board, generally speaking, with the political agenda that they are moving forward with. You know, I think his disagreement with them on the Dobbs ruling was mostly a matter of strategy and not really a matter yeah. of principle. I think he thought that Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided and that the more strategic and political way to do it would have been to do it incrementally by eroding the Casey un undue burden standard. 
Um, you know, and then, you know, now I think he, I think he's sort of lost control of his court in some ways, right? He's certainly lost control of public perception. He's lost control of his right flank. But I think fundamentally, he's still committed to this project. Let's, we can't forget, John Roberts grew up in the, in the Reagan DOJ, developing the very sort of anti-democratic theories to, to erode and destroy the Voting Rights Act that he ultimately implemented as Chief Justice in the, you know, 2013 Shelby County decision. Like this guy is a part of the anti-democratic project. And I think media treatment of this guy as a, you know, like, uh, you know, somebody committed to judicial legitimacy is just way too credulous. I, uh, watching him preside over the, uh, the impeachment. insurrection impeachment, yeah. that was it for me. I got a full view of this guy for the first time, really, in all these years. I was like, oh, I see who you are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's, he's all, signed with all these opinions. Working. Fuck off. You know, yeah. that's how I feel about the chief justice of the Supreme Court. I can't believe it, how yeah. radical I've become. That's but these yeah, yeah. are crazy. I know, in such a short amount of time. I was just a regular lawyer, you know, like working yeah. for justice and equal equal rights. Well, it's um, just insanities going on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, last question yeah. before we move on. Okay. The justices, I don't think they're doing much except for Clarence Thomas, I think, is just I, he's just traveling all the time and, and hanging out and having fun. So the clerks for the justices are doing, I think, the heavy lifting here. If the justices are dirty, are their clerks dirty too? That's the question. So it depends what you mean by dirty, right? I think they're very much increasingly, increasingly um, sort of part of a very strategic political project being identified. And, and Leonard Leo has talked about this, um, identified kind of within a broader cohort of Federalist Society participants as sort of like the rising stars and then they're really taken care of they're kind of connected to the right judges who connect them to the to the right justices um and then they're and then often they'll you know be, be funneled to ideological law firms or ideological litigation shops so i think they're very much invested in, and you can see leonard leo doing this now outside of the law in pipeline building and in, in leadership development and networking um, in a way that the left, I think, really needs to learn from, frankly, because yeah. Um, they, yeah, these clerks are becoming powerful in their own right. A lot of them, a lot of Thomas clerks are now on the on the lower courts doing yeah. really scary stuff. That's right. He well, he gets them from what's his district that he gets them from uh, that come up through yeah. Thomas. They they I worked it out. One they used to be that way. The one in the oh, south. The one in the south. The one in the south. The guy that, it, well, I think well, Scalia had the fifth. Scalia had the fifth. I know no, that. No, it's from like the twelfth or something. Yeah, it's like um, the one in right. Alabama. It's the guy. Oh, yeah. in Alabama. The eleventh. Then he has the eleventh. Eleventh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The eleventh. So it because it used to be we we looked into this. We got really fascinated by the clerks mm. that it used to just be law students and whatever recommendations. And then um, I think uh, with Scalia and then Thomas for sure, they figured out probably all Leonard Leo's masterminding to cultivate very specific operatives. You know, Jenny brings them in. They're all her clerk, right? The yeah. clerk of these districts. They go up, they clerk for Thomas, and then they get recommended back down to end up on these courts. Yep, and absolutely. it just becomes more and more extreme mm -hmm. in these districts that these extremist SCOTUSes sort of rule. It's like yep. a, it's a crazy sort of, it reminds me of Braveheart. Remember <laughs> like the long shanks that he had his guys and that he would like, they would figure out and it would put them in there and it put them in the territories. And that's what it's like. It's like yeah. You know, long shanks. Yeah. yeah. You know, Greg, your last question about the clerks made me realize there's a, there's another thing I think people could push their senators to do, um, which is on the appropriations front. You know, I think, you know, we think about what, con what powers Congress has. The power of the purse is pretty undeniable. And, you know, the, the judiciary just got a big raise in the form of more security budgets, right? There was a big, mm. it's a bipartisan push to give them more security. And Alito is writing today about how it's the left that's making them targets of, of assassination. At the time. <laughs> I, I would, I, I would, maybe it's the fact that they're forcing women into births, unwanted births, that it has made them so yeah, extreme. Yeah, us. Are against yeah. Them. But, you know, that's actually something that, you know, Democrats could do. And again, it brings in a whole bunch of complicated politics in a bunch of other areas. But, you know, if they really wanted to play constitutional hardball, they would start, you know, withholding salaries for those clerks that are doing all this work. Ooh. Just yeah. OK. Them, right. Like Let's that. get with it. Let's get with it. I um, like that. I like that you brought in Braveheart, LB. Because <laughs> there's an Opus Dei theme to all of this. Yes. There's a radical Catholic theme to the whole yes. thing. Yes. And here's Mel Gibson front and center. OK. We got to move along to. to all right. Um, My pleasure to join you guys. Thanks so much. 
No, no, no. Stay, no, stay. No, 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 no. no, no. Oh, okay. Unless you want to. You got to sure go. My wife is like, where, where, where is he? <laughs> well, if, if you, you have, if you have to leave, let no, it, just, I, I can hang for a bit. I can hang. I can hang. Just give a wave, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll <laughs> send you off. Either way, either way. Thank you for all of that because this is really good oh, information. My God, and, and where can people find you on Twitter? Let's say it right now. Oh, just my name, Alex Aronson. I don't tweet very much, um, but uh, that's me. Alex well, Aronson. I found some good stuff on your on your yeah. Twitter feed today, so I think it's worth it. And then. If you're writing articles or you you end up doing anything, you just give it to us and we'll make sure we okay. boost everybody yeah, so everyone yeah. reads what you we have boost. to say. That's what we do. Yeah, and we there's do. so much more, guys. There's just so much more here. They're like, honestly, we could do this for days. Okay, so come back. <laughs> so come back. Please we do. Need to see more in you. All, All right. right. What's this Florida thing, LB? Okay, I want to talk about this Florida thing. And Alex, I you know, I, I'm sorry I didn't get this to you ahead of time, but I this just got brought to Greg and I's attention this week. That there's this new, uh, oh, surprise, surprise, a new Florida bill that is um, kind of happening in secret, um, some really horrible things within it, and everyone's distracted by by other things in Florida, but there's something actually very serious going on. So this comes from uh, uh, a college professor who specializes in this and kind of raised the alarm to us. So it's called House Bill HB 1021. And hidden inside that bill, which is like a redo of, uh, you know, they kind of renew old bills or whatever. Uh, the old bill is SB 990. So if we compare that, this new Florida bill to SB uh, 990, this one is at HB 1021. They are doing away with background checks for daycare workers. Why would they do away with background checks so, for daycare? Daycare oh. for the little ones. You mean people that take care of children? People that take care of children. You used to have to go through. There was a three-day um, hold, like to do a background check. So you could you could maybe work for three days or start to train, but not be around children in a facility while there was a background check going on to make sure you were not a child predator, right? or had some other thing going on in your background that would make it so that the people hiring you wouldn't hire you. So that got pushed to five days for, for, for that. But then there's a 45 day um, delay now if for background checks. So someone could be in and working for 45 days without anybody knowing whether this was a child sexual predator or had some kind of crime in their past background. So this person alerted it is a special specializes in social work and as a college professor was like, oh my God, this is like the worst thing that to ever happen. Um, so uh, if you don't clear, if they don't get the five day background check done, you get this, you get a provisionally allowed to work for 45 days, but also the background is only for full time. They've completely eliminated it for part time work. So you don't have to, you can go in part time and there's no background check. It goes into effect on July 31st um, if it's signed into law and they've hidden it inside this tax break bill. So it's this weird language inside a tax break bill that's specific to daycare workers for it's children. Free market in action. So, I mean, Mike, I, first of all, I just want everybody to understand, know that this is happening. I, you know, we, Greg and I are like, okay, we'll alert it. We'll do a segment on it. But I also, why? Like, how does this, how does this get lobbied? It's not like it's a big pharma and they're lobbying and they have a thing. This is just mom and pop daycares all around Florida. Or. A big. Or is there somebody that writes this bill that just decided they really want to make sure that they can hire a pedophile? I, I I can't I can't figure out how this got in there. How did it happen? It's just another anti-government attack. They 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 want to they want to dismantle government altogether, and th they think this is a matter of like liberty. That's what they're that's what they're pushing. This is like a well, I mean, you know, if we don't have the freedom to hire pedophiles to work at our at our daycare Nurseries. centers, yeah, you yeah. know, I just wave the "don't yeah. tread on me" flag right now. 
I mean, it's part of like the, uh, sorry to bring it back to law, but like, this is what's happening. It's like the Lochnerization of America again. Lochner, of course, being a reference to the Supreme Court era where we allowed kids to, you know, work. And there's, and there are efforts yeah. right now to bring back, you know, child, child, labor. child labor. Arkansas, right? yeah, you go. What's her nose? Huckabee Sanders. Yeah. It's awful. Pretty bad. Yeah. And Sorry. that is just a little laboratory of authoritarianism and autocracy down there. Yeah. Florida. Texas and Florida are laboratories of authoritarian American authoritarianism. It's a very specific kind of authoritarianism happening here. Um, we, we're creating our own little breed of it, brand of it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I was pleased to see the DeSantis story about his activities at Gitmo, you know, jumping up into more mainstream coverage today. So, you know. Oh, I guess that. Yeah, I don't know. He was there. He was around when all this fucking torture was happening, allegedly. Yeah. So yeah, he's just a bad, 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 bad guy who, when it is asked a question by a member of the press who isn't on his team and has been properly vetted, bobbles his head like, ah! So, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, going on. Doesn't he know that Japan is where H.W. Bush vomited on that guy's lap? Like, stay out of Japan, dude. Just don't go there now. Come on, man. Uh, he's a dirty meatball. That's all. He's a dirty I like, meatball. I like the meatball uh, nickname he's getting. I think we all right. need to stick. Announcements. We're done with okay. Florida, right? We're, We're done, done with Florida. Florida. We're done with Florida. That's Announcements. It. We're going to have an after hours. Um, that's what we're going to do. True Player will release the link to the after hours. I will try very hard not to screw it up this time. And uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do that. You know, ten minutes after this, the, the conclusion of this uh, of this program, we'd also like to thank all the uh, the people that signed up for memberships. Thank you. We thank appreciate you. you. We appreciate the the audience here is so much fun and uh, pushes us to be on top of our game. Certainly. Uh, yeah. And Alex, you will know. have a good time if you want to rewatch this on YouTube because you have a little bit of a panic attack in the middle of the night and think, "What did I say with those two crazy people?" <laughs> <laughs> You were Which fine. I, you were you were good. I know you were fine, but I know good. for certain many guests have that moment. Um, you, you can when you pull it up on YouTube, you'll see all these comments, and you've got a lot of uh, people are really appreciating this conversation. Okay. So I think Beautiful. for sure okay. they're all going to want to see. Reach out if you ever want to talk about. It. I'm always happy to talk about. This. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. You're going to get more Twitter followers. You're going to get more Twitter followers. Sure. Um, also, we have a trailer. We made a trailer. Trunk made a trailer oh, yeah. for our show, we have a trailer. and uh, it's out there. It's in the ether. I actually put it on Twitter. I, I uploaded it to Twitter just because okay. I, I don't know. You know, maybe Elon won't blow it up. Um, but well, um, hey, if you don't mind sharing yeah. the trailer, we would be we would be obliged. That would be yes. Lovely. Please share our please share content yeah. so we can get more subscribers and membership because LB is on strike. <laughs> I want strike. Is this I show have, affected by the strike? I hope this show is so affected. There's a script. I can't even tell you. Like I had took this whole hiatus from from direct like television, film, screenwriting, and did podcasts, which is all great. But I made sure those were all under my guild rules. So even that, and then I was just like I had a, a big feature film and a big two two TV shows all going out in the next three months, and then it was like I, like several weeks ago, a few weeks ago, my agent was like. Yeah, it's the strike is happening. So I've got time. I'll share. I'll I'll try to be more active on all that. Not that this is about me at all, but I'm freaking out, you guys. I'm freaking out. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Stick oh it to God. the man always works. It's always good. Okay. All right. The many, you know, we are many, they are few, as Shelley said line. in the mask of anarchy. All yeah. right. That's it. You we are men. Out loud. Okay, Wait, number last five. Topic. Eight last minutes, topic. That's it. We're not going. Is that the long. timer. It's, it's going. It's going. Joe Biden. Boom. Re-election. Yes. Biden Harris, 2024. Boom. Okay. I want to clear a couple things up off okay. the top here. Uh, this is directed to the media members. I know people watching this know this already. I ranted about this on my podcast today. Stop talking about how fucking old he is. It doesn't matter. That's the entire GOP talking point. He's too old. I just think he's too old. That's all they fucking care about is, is hoping and praying that people get freaked out because he's old. It doesn't make any difference. Talk about his accomplishments. That's all we got to be doing. This is, this is the most accomplished president of my lifetime. 
He's one of the best presidents we have ever had, period. Full stop. Promote that. Don't worry about how fucking old he is. You know who else is old? Donald Trump. And he's on trial for, you know, the rape thing right now and the Jack Smith thing and everything else. Okay. So you want oh, Biden's old, but we're going to take a guy that's like three years younger and an active criminal. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing we talked about Mark Judge before, you know, Kavanaugh's buddy from Georgetown Prep, Mark Judge, who pivoted and became this right wing like laboratory guy has been workshopping attacks on Kamala Harris. This election is going to be, they're going to hit her hard. They're going to Hillary her. We yeah. must, we must push back on this. We must. If you personally don't like Kamala, first of all, what's wrong with you? But secondly, even if you, do, even if you don't like her personally, don't tell anybody that. Just push it. <laughs> Just go with the good stuff. We need to win the election. We need to win. You know, have, have a, fun little, in have a little Kamala story. You want a little Kamala story? Yes, yes. please do. Right, so, Tell us. So, something. so the day the day after the Kavanaugh hearing, when they were forcing him through, they forced a vote through on yes. Kavanaugh, and we left in boycott. We, like my boss left, a bunch of them left, Harris left, and I I completely breached like Senate protocols, and I went on a little tirade in the ante room. I was so angry. I <gasps> talked about how this was just a redux of the Thomas hearing and the high tech lynching line. And, you know, my boss was a little uncomfortable with how animated I was, but Harris, she was like with me. She was like, I could tell. She didn't do anything too affirmative, but like she was listening and she was like, she was pissed too. And so like, she's there, she's in the fight with us. <laughs> That's it, amen. Yeah. She's in the fight with us. That's it. When she's in her mode, like she was on the Senate Judiciary Committee and on, uh, you know, that when that prosecutor comes out and she's there, yeah. that, I just want to encourage this for Kamala. Go there, stay there, grab that I intonation. This, I think this court fight is the one for her. She should be yeah. in this. Fight. Yeah. Be in this fight. yeah, that's good. I'm gonna. I'm writing that down. I'm gonna get to the Kamala. People. You know, it was. It was. Is our our little teammate Chunk <laughs> and me with my little brain. Um, coming up with that Biden of choice. Did you see that viral video of Biden? <laughs> it's like, you know, and, and a little secret help from our secret producer, you know? Yeah. Yes. So Can we make a com? Maybe we should make a Kamala one. I know the song too. Oh, what's the song? Let's do it. Let's workshop uh, it. Right it's White Lines. It's White Lines by Grover. It's a, let's all vote for Kamala Harris. Let's all vote for Kamala Harris. That's it. I don't know that song. Yes, you do. I'm just not singing it right. There's no fucking way you don't know that song. Well, you didn't know the Sarah. Okay, the other thing we'll just tease for people. We were <laughs> going to do a karaoke for the Tucker people uh, to Sarah McLaughlin's um, In the Arms of an Angel because, you know, they're all so sad that they've lost Tucker. So they need a, it was inspired by a Rick Wilson treat. And like, they need a funeral song. They need to mourn, you know. So in the arms of the, of the hater, the hating, right? So let's we'll we'll do a bunch of media we'll get some stuff going here i got nothing else to do oh you know little long tears for tucker i don't know tears for tucker yeah 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 any I'm ideas you have this alex is when I get in trouble, is I this is when you get in trouble <laughs> well, we, want that we don't want you to get into trouble we want you to come back just yeah yeah my so boss had to be like my boss was like she lived in enough <laughs> <laughs> he was great. He's he's great too. He's a, he's an amazing guy. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's love him. Show. Yeah, love we love him. him. He's been fighting a good fight. So. Yeah. Yeah. Lord knows. Um, oh God. Okay. Right. So yeah. So that's that's what I got. We're excited about Biden. And again, strategically, I I know we're in a weird time. Blah blah blah. Historically speaking, incumbent presidents don't lose unless they really fucking suck, or there's some weird spoiler thing going on. Um. And I know Robert Kennedy Jr. might be the weird spoiler. Seven people might vote for him. Ah! No, Biden is going to win. OK, if he decides not to run, there's going to be a primary and it's going to be a fucking shit show. So if we're interested in like preserving democracy, Biden must win reelection, whether we think whether we have, you know, problems with him or not. That's it. That's this is the system. You can't be like. Well, the candidates are the same. Democrats, Republicans are the same. They're fucking not the same. Democratic Party has a lot of problems. Yes. But 
They're not active fascists. They're not the ones trying to ban all abortions. They're not the ones being like, hey, just buy a gun and put it in your trousers and walk around wherever you want. We don't care. They're not the ones that are abetting pedophilia in Florida. Like, they're not doing that shit. So unless you want that, the two parties are not the same. That's it. It's just how it goes. We have an enormous, enormous historical advantage by having the incumbent president and having a good one who's made major tangible benefits to people living in this country. So support him and anybody that talks about his age, just be like, shut the fuck up, man. Just shut up. That's it. That's what I got. Okay. Anybody else have any, have any closing? Look at the last word tonight. Have any no, closing I mean, comments? Uh, you know, look, don't, it, 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 we need to come talk about teamwork. Let's bring this back around to the team. Okay. You can't let those, the corruption be the only thing that figures out how to consolidate around a message and consolidate around a team play, you know? Uh, yeah. So it's time. I think Dems have been getting better about all this, but it's time to really uh, bring it home. Yeah. This is a, I, cause we're not out of it. We're just not out of it. We're not. And we're not because of this court. I'm sorry yeah. to say if it yeah. wasn't for the court, I would feel a lot better. Yeah. But we have to expand it. It yeah. must be expanded period. Oh, I have one little question for you, Alex. So <laughs> if Roe can be overturned, can't we um, do away with Heller? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we just need to have the court back or we need to pass a constitutional amendment. It's a constitutional holding. So so we would we would we need something that has the power to change the constitution, which is the Supreme Court or you know a constitutional convention, which is probably not a good idea for us right now. We're, no. Where the state legislatures are. No. No. Okay. That's right. the, that's the Simpsons parody of the remember the the I'm just a bill and the schoolhouse rock thing. Yeah. The Simpsons did a parody of that about the you know, making an amendment to the Constitution where Phil Hartman says that would be unconstitutional. But if you change the Constitution, talk good to Phil Hartman. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So again, True Player is going to tweet or tweet or whatever. He's going to put up now or soon or at some point the link, the magic link to get to the, uh, the app. Put it up now, True Player, so I can post And thank it. you, True Player, for, for all your hard work with this. Um, Alex Aronson, this was so awesome that you were here. Thank you so much yeah, for, for sharing your expertise okay. with us. Yeah. We appreciate also the fight that, that, that you put up there and that you continue to do against these yes. dark forces. Um, you know, you're doing great work, and we, you know, we really, really appreciate you. So thank you for Thanks, for likewise. Really, really, thanks for having me. Um, all right, guys. We'll see you on the after on the after hours. Is it called after hours? That's what it's called. It's after hours. Yeah, the club know. the clubhouse is closed, and now we're all gonna go we're inside. Going to this is like, yeah. Have you been hours. in London? Everyone's everyone's like the pub is closed, and like every, the entire population of London is in the street at like eleven oh five. It's very strange. <laughs> very strange. Okay. Okay. Well, all right. we'll we'll stay in we'll stay in here, but we'll see you all after hours. And Alex, yeah. you're coming back. Thank you so much. Please I come can back. Tell already. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Take care. Good night, everyone.